comes from Madrid and will talk to us about the education in the digital age. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Well, I will speak about edu education and education for employment, and uh, specifically in the, in the digital age. Uh, this session will have the following structure. Uh, we will have first, sorry, we will have first an introduction. I will give so a short overview of the main facts which have happened in education, mm, and especially dealing with all the digital revolution we have lived during the last years and which we will be living in the next years too. Then we will have a short video mm, uh, about the work of the future. And uh, then we will go to a panel. Mm. It's a panel of campuseros. Mm. Uh, all of them are participating actively here in the campus party. Mm. Uh, I have focused uh, specifically in young people. Mm. It's young people who have been entrepreneurs. Some of them, when they were just 13 or, or 14 years, mm. uh, they are freelancers, are people who are well adapted to what uh, our digital society is. Mm? And also we, we have here two representatives of, um, of the older people who have had to, to jump into the revolution with more difficulty, mm? such that we receive a fresh uh, view of what people think about education. People who have had special needs to educate, many of them uh, with their own effort, by self-studying and so on. And then we will go into a debate and questions. Well, what is the digital revolution? I mean, to understand the digital revolution, it's very good to uh, see it in the context of the knowledge revolution we have had, which are not many. I mean, most of you know, <coughs> when writing appeared, I mean, 5,000 5, years ago, pardon, in Mesopotamia, this was a big revolution, which is, was similar to what we are living now, but it was much lower. Mm? And this revolution, this is a knowledge revolution which uh, impacts our brains, our minds, our culture, it impacts everything, had a very, very strong impact in the sense that the first cultures <laughs> appeared. I mean, in Mesopotamia, in Egypt, and all the Mediterranean, in Asia, and so on. The second big revolution in management was the printing. When Gutenberg invented the printing, we had a qualitative uh, jump hmm, from the Middle Ages into the New Age, where the modern society was built, where education appeared, where <laughs> everything happened. Hmm. And around 50 years ago, the digital revolution started. Hmm, um, and we have seen very, very quick and <laughs> impressive changes during the last times. So what is what uh, <laughs> this has implied? Well, a complete change in our society and much bigger changes we will be seeing in the next years. Mm. Uh, the impact of the digital revolution, the main impact, is that we have knowledge everywhere. Mm. Uh, basically, uh, the people who are born now, mm, like, I, like I have put here, they, they are born with uh, a tablet or a smartphone in their hands. Mm, and from very young, I mean, even at those ages, there are parents which are putting the, their uh, new <laughs> child to, to play on a, on a tablet. Mm? Uh, the, <laughs> the, term, sorry, the term tablet computing uh, has been coined mm? because, I mean, a new complete uh, educational uh, platform is being created on the tablet and many universities and schools are basing and offering everything to be accessib uh, accessible from a given tablet. Mm? And the future will be even uh, much more radical in terms of devices and of the access we will have because we are already starting to see wearable devices like for example Google Glasses, mm? uh, <coughs> the watches uh, which uh, everything is expecting from Apple but Apple never releases and everybody is releasing an, a watch, no, an iWatch now mm? and many other devices which will come and which we cannot even imagine. The ones which will <coughs> be successful are very difficult to predict. Mm? And of course, after it, we will have the bionic interface, nanotechnology, and all this connecting the system, the internet, the computers, the devices, 
directly to our brains and to our nerves. No? And this is something which seems far away, but it's not so far. I have seen experiments of people who have connect, uh, has connected uh, to their nerves in, in their arms and in other places directly, uh, controls of, of uh, wheels, of motors, and of, of many things. And they have been for months with a plug here directly to their nerves, which they could connect, and they could connect something and move things and interact with physical devices. <coughs> So, I mean, all this technology is not only technology. Mm? We are we and our circumstance. Mm? And so this technology has impacted us very strongly. Mm? And uh, technology has changed the people. And the students we have today are very different from the students uh, which existed when I was a student or when David was a student. Mm? This is why I've selected so many young people so that they can tell us what they think about the education of today and about what should be the education of the future. Uh, <laughs> basically, the main characteristic about those people, and well, this is something you should confirm or reject, hmm, but this is what most people think, is that they don't want to be taught or to be preached as we were when we were at the university, the older people. They want to make things, to create, to participate, to learn. They want to be active. Hmm? And this can be seen at many levels, not just at the educational level. <laughs> so the education of the future, and many people are redesigning it in this way now, should be like a trip, a knowledge trip, <laughs> where one acquires the skill and the knowledge <laughs> we would need for our future lives, and to, <laughs> to have uh, an earning and, and to, to be able to live in our society. So students must discover <laughs> things, hmm? and it's uh, this doing by learning, which I prefer to, to <laughs> term is a do and search to learn. Because one of the most important things we have today is searching, searching over the internet, because the internet is a vast information pool where we can find many things. Hmm? But not everything there is sound, not everything is good. Hmm? So a term has been coined, which is information literacy, hmm? which is basically being able <laughs> to extract the right information from this vast pool of information where we have lots of rubbish and a couple of good things or many good things, but which many times are hidden inside what exists. Hmm? So information literacy is something people, I mean, uh, should be taught at, at schools in the sense that they are able to search, to compare, to look for alternatives, to see and to contrast, such that they can extract the right information. Mm. Well, in this emotion, in this trip, mm, in this educational trip, the concept of educational <laughs> process is important. So what educators, in my opinion, have to do today, and in the opinion of many people, is that they must <laughs> create, sorry, sorry. They must create learning processes hmm, <laughs> which implement this learning trip. Hmm? And in these learning processes, they are not the, the professors or teachers which give these this magistral uh, classes. Hmm? They are more tutors to help students to, to make these trips. And sometimes they all can also go to the classroom and present the uh, topics and things. But everything gets much more interactive and much more active from the student side of you. Hmm? So an important issue here is, of course, to create processes where doing and searching in order to learn and to acquire new knowledge and new skill is one fundamental part <laughs> of, of, of this trip. Mm? Uh, the social and collaborative dim dimension is also very important. In the past, I mean, it was in the campuses where you met other people who were learning, and so you learned in the group, in a social and in a collaborative context. Mm? But today, this group has expanded, and we have all the social network, Twitter, Facebook. We have many uh, social networks also for education, content creation uh, networks, and so on. Mm? So connecting not only with your nearest local environment is important, you must to co connect also with the rest. Mm? Uh, personalization and gamification is something which uh, starts to be possible. Mm? Because as you have, ex <laughs> you have uh, applications, mm, learning educational applications, which 
uh, can support personalization, can extract a profile of you, they can use recommenders and other kinds of tools to really recommend you the elements uh, you need. Mm? Um, also gamification, such that <laughs> your process through this learning trip or your trip uh, is motivated and you have so prizes and that you have a motivation to really go on, in addition to the existing motivations which today exist mm, in the educational system. Mm. Um, and another idea is that uh, the big resources we have always used, like uh, books and so are very useful, they are still valid, but other resources are getting more and more used, and especially a term which has been coined, which is called micro-learning, mm, with micro, micro resources, mm, small videos, <laughs> snippets of information, even tweets <laughs> pointing to something. All this is, is the micro approach mm, to the resources. Has also a very important application in education. Because uh, sometimes in a book you need a lot of time until you reach the information you have. If you get exactly to the micro resource which contains the information you need and you have a way to easily accessing to it, you would save a lot of time. Hmm? Well, let's go now into the educational technology. Hmm? Uh, educational technology has evolved, I mean, the book hmm, since Gutenberg has been the main element and even before, I mean, they, they were handwritten, but you had mainly books. Hmm. Uh, then multimedia and videos appear, uh, <laughs> LMS and learning management systems and uh, learning courses. Hmm. Uh, then, I mean, universities went open and then created repositories of information, like the open courseware initiatives in many universities. And finally, the last invention has been the MOOC, the, open, the Massive Open Online Courses. Hmm? This is something which appeared in, in uh, 2007 and which has been uh, really booming since then. Hmm? And is considered one of the most important achievements. Hmm? What is the history of the Massive Open Online Courses? Well, the first one which is considered so was a course which is, <laughs> was, uh, was given in, in, those, in, in 2007. Mm? It was not called a, a mock. Mm? It was made by David Willey of the University of Utah, and it was part of the Open Course Was Initiative. Mm? And so he made an open course where he was tutoring and where he created a collaborative and social structure, which is basically what is behind a mock. Mm? <laughs> and well, this was so successful that other people started to. <laughs> other people, sorry, other people started to <laughs> follow it. And next year, mm, Dave Cormier and Brian Alexander, mm, in a course in connectivism, uh, created a term mock mm, and made a course which was even bigger. This was, uh, I think, around 1,000 students, which reached 2,300 students mm, with this structure, which has mainly added to the open software initiative, to the open courseware initiative, so the social and collaborative dimension mm, and the <laughs> educational process mm, together. Mm. And in 2011, uh, <laughs> a record, a, a record was was reached, which was a course in the, at the Stanford University by those two. Sorry, I have. I always press the wrong button. A, a course by, by those two <laughs> professors there, which reached over 100,000 persons. Hmm? And well, then this made everybody <laughs> enormously interested. Companies appeared. A small company had been created the year before, which was No Labs, which was transformed later in Udacity. Hmm? Then Coursera appeared and many others in the Spanish speaking area. Miriadax appeared. Hmm? And so all of them try to <coughs> enter into this new market of education over the internet. Hmm? So this massive access <laughs> hmm? has been, this massive uh, delivery of information. Hmm? has been really uh, due to the following fact. Hmm? Mocks are really a significant step towards this educational trip. Hmm? Because, well, they are massive, so they can cover the whole world, I mean, which is um, in line very much with the United Nations Millennium Objectives to really <laughs> spread knowledge and education to all the globe, hmm? to everywhere. 
Mm? And <laughs> this is a technology which has this capability. But this is also a technology which allows to <laughs> have an educational process where examinations and the standard, we could say, educational practices exist. Mm? where you work by learning by doing and by searching and by <laughs> doing uh, standard educational activities, but where you have also a social and collaborative structure which makes <laughs> all, the, all the students mm, work properly. These courses are usually organized uh, in a way where people are uh, teamed in groups, mm, as we make here in the hackathons, like in, in Hack for Something Better, and so the students, they work together in small groups. So these 100,000 don't interact all with all, but they are grouped and you get into one of those groups and then you interact with your group. And then the people who are running the course, they just mark the timing, provide, answer general questions and uh, do the general management of the course. But many of the answers of the interactions are just peer-to-peer -peer interaction between the groups or between groups or among these hundreds of thousands of people interacting there. Mm? And these courses are also micro-resource based. Mm? <laughs> they are based uh, on small videos, snippets of videos, explaining each one concept. They may have some additional lectures associated to each of these micro-resources or uh, for a given uh, topic, mm? uh, <laughs> longer resources. And so many of the characteristics of the goals of this uh, <laughs> educational trip are captured here. So this is why I say that this is <laughs> a, a step forward. Also, things are missing, like personalization, gamification, and other things which will be appearing in the future. Mm? For example, just to give you an example, and I will go into the <laughs> video after this. Uh, now we are starting a program uh, based on MOOCs at my university, which consists of five courses. Mm? It's, it's to, on a very hot topic, which is HTML5 design of, of web apps and also of server application using JavaScript with uh, Node and other type of technologies. It's for designers and programmers. It covers also Firefox OS uh, application design. Mm? And the idea is that this is a, a, a mock program which is uh, attended simultaneously by students <laughs> on online in every part of the world and also by students of some of our courses which deal with this topic. So we will mix students, presential students which are on the campus with <laughs> offline students. And we want to measure and see what's happening with this. Hmm? We are planning also to have examinations, presential, but also via video conference for some student who, to, who would like to make the examinations uh, of these courses and receive a degree from UPM. Well, and now we get into a nice video, hmm, which is about the future of work, hmm, which really hits the point, in my opinion. What it says is that during this technological revolution, I mean, jobs are disappearing and new jobs appearing.
This is the future of work. It's a very nice video, which really hits, I think, many of the most important things that we are facing while <laughs> dealing with, uh, <laughs> with all the transformation with the digital revolution is making in our society. So the future is you and you, those people here. And so we would like, I would like to start now the panel. Mm -hmm. uh, I will give the word to, to David first, such that he presents himself and makes his statement about what he thinks about <laughs> the education of, in the digital age. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. Have we got that? Is that coming out? Um, I'm delighted to be here this afternoon because I should have been at school myself uh, today if I hadn't taken early retirement to focus on my own further uh, education. I'm doing a master's degree in film production technology. Um, I've been teaching art for 25 years and during that time I've seen some very interesting developments. I was lucky enough in my first school in 1987 for there to be a supply of Amiga computers and we used those to create a range of animations which um, featured in a magazine at the time. Uh, later on, at my uh, next school, I was uh, able to implement the first web pages there so that uh, when the internet came along, having previously been used to using FidoNet, which some of you might remember where you had to phone up uh, another computer to make connections, we got an internet connection at the school and I started a web page there. Uh, that led to um, the maths teacher talking to me and we produced together some interactive um, math support CDs, initially using JavaScript. At that time, it wasn't as powerful as HTML5 has now made it, so we moved on to using uh, Flash for creating that. Um, so we've see, seen a lot of range of changes there. Thank you. Okay. Well, Pastel, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, it's very interesting what has been said what, today. Okay, what has been said in the in the talk? It's uh, I, I think one of the most interesting things is that no one's going to guarantee you a a, a lifetime job, and I think that is very important because now uh, we have a, a lot of people have the the idea of uh, finishing high school and getting a, a lifetime job where they're gonna have a. Uh, uh, almost fixed salary and a nine-to-five job, and that is going to last for for the rest of of the life. Uh, and I think that's a very good point. And I'd like to uh, talking about education. Uh, I'd like to reference an article I, I read uh, like two months ago, and it said in an in the article that comp uh, that kids don't know how to use computers, and it made some really interesting points that. <clears throat> For example, if you ask anybody, uh, we are in, in schools, we are, we are being teach IT. But what we are teach is how to use Microsoft Word, how to use PowerPoint, or even, uh, I don't know, how to use uh, a Dropbox or something like that. But if you, if you do this, if you teach people how to do a, a really specific thing, and the person doesn't investigate in the matter, uh, when, when you change a button, they're going to freak out because they, they told us, here's this button, and when they move the button and the button is no, no longer there, as they didn't figure out where was the button, they're going to freak out. And another interesting point is that we aren't, ta we aren't taught uh, what computers are, but how to use them. Uh, I think it would be really, really interesting to teach a, 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 a programming language as another language in school, that it's not that difficult, and I think it would be really, really easy. And I, I'd love to live in a, in a, in a, in a world where I, I could ask all my, all my colleagues or my friends or my people of my age and that, has be, that, ha, that use the internet every day and are with a smartphone uh, 24 hours a day, and as the difference between the internet, the World Wide Web, and uh, ISP, and that they actually know the difference. Because I, I, I think we're using the tools, but we don't actually know what's behind it. And I, I think that would be really important. 
and that's okay. it. I mean. uh, Jorge, one thing. I think you have forgotten to introduce yourself. I think it's very interesting if you introduce yourself and you say the companies you have created and the things you have done. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, uh, I started... Uh, my, my, my start is not really beautiful because I started programming apps for the iPhone because I wanted to buy myself an iPhone. So uh, the, the, the thing... Uh, uh, didn't work in my first app, so I created another app, and then I, I got my, my iPhone. And now I co-founded, this year I co-founded with my friend Luis, uh, a startup called Cardwee. We do loyalty card stuff and we take it to the, to the smartphone, doing it right, because, for example, we don't even need to, to download an app for, in, for having the, the loyalty card. It works everything with Passbook. And we use the latest cutting edge technologies in web, de web development. And we're having so much fun there. And I also do a, a TV show app for the iPhone. It's called Zoe. And we are almost, we are preparing a huge update for iOS 7 that is it's going to be great. Yeah, he's still at school. He's not even at the university. <laughs> I, start, I start school on Tuesday. <laughs> okay, now it's Frederick. Hmm? <laughs> So, um, good afternoon. I'm glad to be here. My name is Frederick Mittelstadt. I um, come from Berlin, Germany, but I study at Jakobs University Bremen physics in my fifth semester of undergraduate studies. Um, I was actually quite surprised to be invited here um, because I only introduced myself to Juan two days ago. And during that introduction, I think um, the main point, and th that's also the, my personal main point of view, was... Um, that to me, interdisciplinary projects actually matter the most. At my university, we have a strong focus on international collaboration and interdisciplinary projects. There are actually courses taught by um, professors from different uh, schools. So, for example, from humanities and um, uh, science. For example, my third semester, I had a course on the neuroscience of arts and politics, which is not uh, that, like, it doesn't really fit together when you first think about it, but there is a very valid connection. And uh, these courses are actually most interesting to me personally, and there's also the, these courses uh, what you benefit the most from. Therefore, I think um, teaching, no matter if it is high school or university, should be much more collaborative, and it should be much more transdisciplinary. And also, it should allow uh, students to collaborate on their own projects. Now, teaching in the past has mainly been about delivering knowledge, maybe skills. But that is, in my opinion, not enough. What I've personally always benefited from the most was developing my own projects. I've um, basically taught uh, developing applications myself. By Now I've been working at two computer uh, science research institutes. and. Um, finished quite a few um, IT projects on my own. And at my university, I'm also uh, starting to work as a consultant for IT-related projects um, starting this semester. Um, in my high school, I've already started developing my own e-learning system for my high school. I've presented at the um, research competition for um, yeah, high school students in Germany. and. It was a great success, and that is an example from uh, where I actually benefited from my own project. Now, my school back then did not actually support my project because it was not, back then it was not in the norm to start your own project and to do these things. It was also not in the norm to take part in uh, these science competitions. And wouldn't it be great if we had a school system, yeah, both for high school and for university, where you could start your own projects and actually uh, learn by yourself and I think that is what you really need and if universities or uh, schools do not have the equipment to support these projects then it is necessary to collaborate even uh, across different institutions no matter if it's high schools if it's com uh, with companies with other universities that has to be possible and that will actually enable um, proper education because it's not just about learning facts it's uh, learning for yourself how to solve problems, how to tackle them. And that's what it is really about. Okay, thank you, Frederick. Well, Frederick has not said something which is the reason why I chose him and invited him to this panel. Is that he's working at freelance. At the same time he's studying, he's working as freelance, he's doing projects and he's earning a living. 
while doing so. I don't know if you did it from school, at school, or, or you started at the university. Okay. Okay, thank you. Hmm. So let's uh, have now the, the statement of the, our third entrepreneur. Yeah, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Luis Iván Cuende, not Conde. Um, okay. <laughs> So, um, well, I started working on server development when I was 12 years old. Um, it was because I was bored at the school. It was very boring to be there just doing nothing and, you know, just copying tests and, and I memorizing mean, stuff. So, so, I decided to create my own, uh, like, uh, operating system based on Windows, the a series. Um, and then I was, you know, uh, working more and more on my project and creating, you know, more startups. The first one I created was at, at age 15 and it failed. Um, the second one was, was Carwi, that we launched this July. Um, and well, it's going pretty well, actually. The uh, problem is that uh, what I saw is that um, the more time I dedicated to my personal projects, to my startups, to my uh, you know, software projects, uh, the lower my marks would be. So, uh, for example, uh, I finished high school uh, last June, and I was like, uh, you know, not passing some subjects. Uh, yeah, and, and that's pretty, I mean, uh, because I'm an entrepreneur and a hacker, and I mean, so, someone that has the initiative, that, that has an uh, active state of mind to be able to pass every single subject. I promise that I was not motivated at all, because it's a system uh, for least, uh, at least in Spain, the system is like, uh, you copy what the teacher says, then you memorize it, and you write down that text in the exam. Um, and if you write the text, uh, you know, the, the exact test, you have 10, you have passed, and so on. And, and, and that's another system that, that we have in Spain. So uh, I think instead of talking about what uh, the, the, the perfect educational model could be, we should be uh, starting, you know, implementing it. Because uh, while we are talking here about the future of education, <laughs> there are, uh, you know, teachers in Spain that are dictating every single word and that are, uh, you know, making their students passive instead of active. And I also think that the teacher must disappear. Um, and my mother is a teacher, actually. But I think they should disappear. Because the role, I mean, the teacher was designed to, to bring the content to the student. But now the content is on the internet. So what we need is uh, teachers that drive the, the student to their passions. So you have a student, uh, a 12-year-old uh, guy or girl, and you have to, to drive that students to their passions so they can find out what they like, what job they would like, and they can start studying for that job. Uh, but, I mean, the content is in the Wikipedia, it's in the internet. Uh, you should not be memorizing, you know, stuff that is there in the internet because we all have a smartphones connected to the internet. We can, you know, look up every, every word or every whatever. Uh, so I think teachers might disappear as the first step to create a new, you know, uh, digital revolution in education. Well, they should not disappear uh, at all. I mean, like, uh, disappear. They, they should, like, um, take a new role. Be the ones that drive their students. Not the ones that dictate, but the ones that drive. So that's it. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Uh, Luis, just one question. You haven't introduced yourself also. Spanish uh, people yeah, so are not... Uh, <laughs> please introduce and say the company you have created, because I think yeah. this is very relevant. Here. Yeah, also, uh, I'm a 17 years old hacker entrepreneur. <laughs> and as I, as I said, I started with uh, software development when I was 12 years old. And then I created my first startup at age 15. I was chosen as the best hacker of Europe under 18 years old, also when I was 15 years old. Uh, I'm also an advisor to the vice president of the European Commission, Nelly Cruz. Um, and well, I have uh, founded Carway with, uh, with Jorge. Um, and that's it. I love free software and free culture and everything that is, that is you know, freedom. And I hate the, educational, the Spanish educational system. And I, I'm not going to study in the university. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I chose you because you hate the Spanish educational system. I was told <laughs> and I wanted something to be cr very critical with it. No, no, just keep it. I mean, we are now so starting the, the questions uh, sessions. Hmm? So if you have any questions, uh, just go on. Uh, if not, I would start with a first question to our three young uh, entrepreneurs, hmm? which is, I mean, any of you would like, how did you get the knowledge you needed to be a freelance or to make your spin-offs? Did you get it from school 
Did you get it from books? You, did you get it from the internet? I would like you to be specific. And if it's from the internet, what was the type of content in terms if you go to the type of resources? It, it was in videos, it was in web pages, in web tutorials, in screencasts. I mean, if you can be a little bit more specific, such that we know what your experience has been. Well, uh, I'll search, start, uh, search story, Google, and then if you want to uh, explain more, I, I started learning by uh, by watching screencasts and then I I I started reading some books on the internet because one of the best things on the internet is that if you don't have resources to start you can get free stuff and maybe when you do stuff you then can pay for the content but you can start getting stuff for free that everybody here knows where to get it so that's my my thing. okay then. Uh, I mean, uh, I took the long and hard way, so I started like uh, from the internet. I mean, but not watching screenshots, uh, a screencast, sorry, and tutorials. Just uh, trying, you know, uh, trying with code. Uh, it didn't work it, so I, I discovered like hundreds or, or, or thousands of ways the code didn't work uh, until I discovered the way it worked. So it's from the internet. Uh, Stack Overflow, for example, is awesome for coding, uh, but nowadays. Uh, there is, there is no restriction. I mean, uh, if you are not in the coding world, if you are not a developer, you can also learn a lot of things in, you know, on the internet, like in, in MIT classes, Harvard, and so on. But yeah, Google and Stack Overflow are the main sources. OK. Yeah. Um, when I started learning how to do programming, I mean, that was in 2006 back then, at least I didn't know about pages like Code Academy. I don't think it ever like it existed back then and uh, Stack Overflow. That would have definitely helped me. Um, I basically uh, started by just um, I mean I, I started as a web developer um, for my for my high school and I was just look uh, I was also googling um, on how to do certain um, things and then I. Um, Started reading um, full online courses. Start first on Wikibooks, so just like a side thing of uh, Wikipedia, which has full online courses, which is um, helpful. At least you can get started there. It helped me definitely. I also took classes in um, high school, which were not helpful at all, uh, unfortunately. And then most of the uh, like for the rest of the time, I mainly uh, learned by doing my own projects and then looking up what I actually needed on uh, different online platforms. So starting with Wikibooks, books and when it became available, I also uh, did some courses on Code Academy or Tuts Plus. There are very nice sites on there. Personally, I've never used screencasts because I don't uh, consider them useful for myself, but then that really depends on how you like to learn. But that's basically what I did. Okay, thank you, Frederick. Well, let's go now go with David. <laughs> well, David is like me, an old person who <laughs> had much larger difficulties to, to enter into the digital world, into the digital society, probably, or maybe not, but at least no, I had I, them. I, don't, so I can't agree uh, with you there. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to put some um, yeah, dampers so on some of this because we are, I have got next to me three highly talented young people. and. I think there's likely to, there's a danger of being too, emph too much emphasis on the technology. There, there have been technologies around that people can do self-learning before, and if they hadn't had the internet, and let's face it, they, when I was starting to do um, the school website or do websites, the, the internet is the most fantastic self-teaching tool, especially if you want to create web pages because you look at other people's web pages, you learn how to do them. But if you hadn't had the internet, you'd have gone along to the library, you'd have read encyclopedias, and you'd have been very talented that way. You've got the ability to take those skills and you can market yourself through the internet. That's possibly something that wasn't available before. But um, you will find as you get older that there are cycles that go around and people say, oh, we want, um, we want the teachers not to be didactic, but we want them to be facilitators. Now that I have seen after 25 years of coming around and the new teachers coming in get very excited about the new initiatives and the older ones go, yes, well, we remember that and we remember what the problems were with that as well. 
I mean, there are a number of things that at the moment they are certainly in this country and hearing you talk about what you would have liked to have heard in terms of coding, that uh, ICT has been far too focused on applications rather than teaching people about how the computers work and how programming work. It's rather dis, uh, disturbing to me that when I talk to people and say, uh, or so when I was talking to students, talking to math students and saying, well, you understand binary, you understand hexadecimal, and they're not doing that. What are they doing if they're not talking about those main things? So I would be cautious in saying the internet's going to change everything because you're very motivated. You will know students at school or you were at school who didn't care, didn't want to use the internet, or if they did it, they used it inaccurately. This um, computer literacy or information literacy that you were talking about is a very important thing. Pupils can now uh, put together, say, a mood board of artists that they've looked at, and I look at it and they've done one, say, on Van Gogh, and because they put Van Gogh into the search, they've got a range of pictures that are Van Gogh, and then you look at one and you think, well, that's very interesting. There's a picture of sunflowers and a Coke bottle next to it. They don't understand that the Coke bottle is not applicable. There weren't any Coke bottles when Van Gogh was there. So there has to be some basis of facts that people have as a, as a standing knowledge so that they can uh, make those decisions as whether that's an appropriate picture to be putting in. Okay, thank you very much. Hmm? Well, you have seen now very, very fresh and direct opinions of many people. I precisely went to get the perspective from older people, of younger people. So maybe one of you could join. Very good, thank you. <laughs> Hello. Um, uh, I totally agree with what they said about the school because I'm 35 now and when I was their age I w had the same problem. I used to carry around a book about programming with me, a big book because I didn't have the internet and I felt the same thing. I felt that the school wasn't, wasn't accompanying me and so I'm a bit jealous of a lot of stuff they have today that I didn't have but I, I think they should have a lot more. Uh, but there is another thing that I, I think it's important because I've read a bit about some education made differently. Uh, I come from Portugal, for instance, and I know about a school in Portugal that they secretly uh, use the, a different approach to, um, to education for small children, which was each class wasn't taught by the teacher but was facilitated like I said that it was guided each one would would go and learn what they wanted and in in guidelines that the teacher would give them they would have debates and one thing that I find important is it's it was not only about the subjects but also the way they conducted uh, life in the school if there was a problem they would all gather around and they would decide what was what was going to happen if someone did something bad they would decide the punishment and even the, the parents would come to, to the school and help out with gardening or painting the school so there was a sense of community which is something that now we see it's needed for instance when you see the massive uh, courses so it's impossible for one teacher to evaluate 2,300 students so there, there is a peer evaluation so you start having a sense of community uh, either to help each other to learn or to evaluate each other or to help out or just to, to decide stuff in, 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 uh, in a group so uh, I would like to, to know what you think about that how the school can also can also uh, teach you character, not only s school subjects, you know, yeah. as a community? Well, this is a good question. <laughs> and I think that, well, here I have presented, and I think we have tried to present a very radical approach about the changes to have been introduced. But usually, the, the way is of, of having a good, uh, properly designed things is in the middle way, so that you keep a little bit of the old, a little bit of the new. 
And one of the things which I think is especially needed in the southern countries like Portugal or Spain, because I think you come from Portugal, not from what you said, is to teach uh, students in skill, in social skills, mm? uh, to behave socially, which I have seen that, for example, in other countries like the Netherlands, for example, they do much better at school. I mean, they have lots of social activities. They have meetings. Uh, one is the secretary, he takes the minutes. And, well, they uh, are learn how to work in, in groups and collaboratively and things like that. Hmm? Of course, I mean, uh, teaching uh, the, <laughs> the, the children to be honest, I think is important, but this is also a very difficult issue. It's very complex. Hmm? I think that the, the best thing is that they learn by doing. And the, the learn by doing can be applied also to this kind of things you said. Hmm? If you start the children to work in group, that maybe the group uh, feels and tells one of them that he's not behaving properly, will be much more effective than that this is told by the, the teacher or by somebody. But uh, it's a difficult issue. No, I don't have a solution. I don't know if somebody else would like also to make a comment on this. Would you like? Hmm? <laughs> It's, um, the, the school you talk about in Portugal, there's, there's been experiments like that in this country as well, a famous school called Summerhill. Um, and also some of the other issues that you're talking about, there was a big push, I think about three or four years ago in this country to promote creativity because they wanted to respond to the fact that you're going to have to be far more creative for the new technologies. But uh, it's always ca we don't hear so much about that now. But one of the reasons being that um, the, the schools are measured in terms of their exam results, and you've got to always balance that. So to get the uh, senior management of a team uh, of a school to support the ideas of creativity in which you can have failures and uh, unnecessary failures to, to, to experiment is, is kind of sidelined because they're watching the, the, the exam results and that's going to affect how many people come to the school. So it's a very difficult area. I also think that you made a lot of valid points and um, honestly I uh, think that there is a very strong connection to also what I said earlier because if you have teacher that, teachers that rather facilitate than to just um, rather uh, well preach the um, facts that you are supposed to know and then that are asked on the exam if you uh, give the teacher um, material of any kind online material paper material it doesn't matter and the teacher allows students to within certain boundaries um, do their own projects work on what they are interested in I think you benefit from it so much more because you can do what you like and you can find out actually what you like because how should you know if you don't try and I mean IT the internet especially uh, enables that to a very large extent but it's also an organizational issue as you've already mentioned and I think it is very important that there is this change yes. yeah you want know, to go back to your question uh, I think character uh, should be you know should be created by the person itself not in the school but what I, what I think I'm very worried about is the, um, is the grow, growing of uh, racism in Spain, for example. Uh, and that's because of education. I think in the, in the school, there should be like uh, travels around the world to know their cultures and so on. Because, for example, in Spain, what, what's happening is that uh, the students are not having the adequate experiences to open their minds. So they are creating you know, that kind of uh, racism that is growing over, over Spain. In, in our, you know, in the teens. So what I think is that uh, characters to be created, um, you know, by the students themselves, but if, if we see like these problems that uh, are, we're facing with racism and so on, I think schools should, you know, uh, organize some travels or whatever to, to just point out, you know. So I think the general values should be there, uh, you know, uh, powered by the school, but then the characters to be created by the student uh, themselves. So yeah. Okay. More questions? Somebody like would like to put a question? We have time for one more question. Yeah. Well, if not, if there are no questions from the audience, then I would put a last small question, uh, such that we, because we have not much time, which is the the balance between creativity and discipline. I mean, because our old school system, the one at least in, in which I was uh, educated put the emphasis in discipline. I mean, we have to be very disciplined to everything. 
This was good for certain things, but not good for creativity. Now there is a much higher stress on creativity. And I think both things can coexist, but not uh, <laughs> too well. Uh, you must have discipline, but uh, being creative op often is, is being uh, a little bit uh, chaotic. No? So, what do you think about it? Between this dilemma with him, maybe? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> one of the problems that I was seeing in my school towards uh, in the last few years before I left was the use of mobile phones, because obviously you've got a, a very powerful tool there but a number of schools are encouraging that. A number of other ones are, are banning the use of mobile phones in school because while you could use these smartphones to get the information, you've also got it as a great distraction. So the, there are some strong issues that have got to be solved there. Okay, and there's one last intervention and then... I think, um, I mean, in the German school system, you will certainly have creative projects. It's not like that, but... In my opinion, you need to have a focus on discipline because without discipline, you cannot actually accomplish anything. That's a problem that I see with many projects that are being pursued because they start and are not finished and it never really works out. So I think you have to have a certain discipline or you need to learn how to discipline yourself to actually do things, not just talk about them, not just doubt them, but to actually make them happen. That is the one thing that you need. But apart from that, you need to unleash your creativity to actually do good projects. And that's, I think, the balance that you need. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, so we have come to the end. Thank you very much to our panelists. I think they were great. Mm. Thank you very much to you. And so we finish here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Juan, and everybody else on stage. And thank you all for coming. This was our last session on Hypatia stage this week. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed your time at Campus Party, and I wish you a great evening. Thank you. <laughs>